1944 in review. The Mutual Network presents its annual summary of the news of the year, featuring from its file of historic recordings the voices of General Eisenhower, General MacArthur, President Roosevelt, King George of England, Thomas E. Dewey. The actual sounds of history in the making. Sounds and voices as they were broadcast over Mutual during the last 12 months. 1944 in review. Tonight, our narrator is one of America's most distinguished radio reporters, the director of WOR's War Services and News Division, Dave Driscoll. We've passed another year in this global war for the freedom of the human soul, and it's time once more to look at the scoreboard. The score is in our favor. Where in 1943 we shifted from the defense to the offense, this year we carried the fight to the enemy and began slugging toward final victory. Tonight, the G.I. boots of American infantrymen are treading the so-called sacred soil of Nazi Germany. General Douglas MacArthur has returned to the Philippines. American forces have pushed northward up the Italian boot to the Alps. The Balkans have crumbled. The bombing of Tokyo is no longer a miracle. And the army of the Soviet Union is closing in on Czechoslovakia and Austria. The price we have paid the limits of the human mind. I paid part of that price. I've lost two sons. I paid part of it. I've been torpedoed five times at sea. Ever try swimming in water covered with burning oil? Hey, you can count me in. I own a plant that converts scrap paper into food containers. I worked 18 hours a day, and then I broke down. They say my heart won't last another six months. Part of that price was on me. I'm a doctor in the Army at a battalion aid station where the wounded kids keep coming in and coming in. I was in Rotterdam when the Luftwaffe came over. I was in a concentration camp. They lined us My up. My brother is in the Stalag Luft 3. All of these people have paid a price. So have you and I and the hundreds of millions of citizens in the United Nations. But one of the greatest facts in the story of 1944 is the fact that we have probably paid only half of the bill for victory. There is more to come. Much more. <laughs> understanding of the events of 1944 will be clear if you will keep in mind what might be called the 1944 timetable. Time was indeed the priceless asset for which fascism fought. Our timetable called for the defeat of Germany in the late fall of this year, the all-out crushing of Japan much later. And as the year began, it looked as though we'd made a good bet. Mark Clark's fifth was scrambling over stubborn mountain peaks toward Rome. The eighth was marching up the Adriatic coast past the miserable, punch-drunk, starving Italian populace. Symbolically enough, past blood-stained statues of the Lord Jesus. The Russians on the edge of the Pripet marshes were menacing Warsaw. Adolf Hitler was becoming more mystic. In the Pacific at the year's beginning, MacArthur was running a hidden ball play, blasting at Rebal, threatening truck, and keeping the little monkeys of Otenshi Sami the Emperor squealing and jumping every which way. The word monkeys is too cordial. For as the year opened, mutual listeners received an elementary lesson in Japanese. It was a report from Captain Samuel Gracio of the 4th Air Force. The captain made the never-to-be-forgotten march of death from Batan to San Fernando. He saw United States soldiers bayoneted, spit upon, and killed ruthlessly. After a year in a Jap prison camp, Captain Gracio escaped from Mindanao. Still visibly shaken... The captain did his best to tell his story. Then in groups of 100, we began the march of death. Their way of giving us directions was to swat Americans with the butts of their rifles. And as we marched passing Japs, would throw up their hands and laugh in mockery of our surrender. It's a good thing we didn't know what was ahead of us. We marched 140 miles to San Fernando, and every mile was marked by new methods of torture and brutality. They gave us no food and no water. Nineteen kilometers beyond our defense lines, as we plodded along without food or water, under the grueling sun and under almost constant beatings with fists and rifle butts, we came upon hundreds of bodies of American and Filipinos. They had been shot or bayoneted. 
That far from where the fighting had taken place, the poor fellows could only have been murdered in cold blood. Later, Captain Gracio was questioned by Colonel Snavely of the 4th Air Force. Said Colonel Snavely... Well, Captain, you said something last night about one of our boys being run down by a Jap tank. Yes, we were so weak and so sick that we just looked on in horror. The words had come down the line that Jap sentries up ahead were striking, were striking all the boys on the head if they wore helmets. They hit them with two-by-fours as they passed. Well, I threw my helmet in the ditch, but Colonel Dias didn't. They hit him and knocked him clear off the road into the ditch. I tried to help, but they pounced on me, beat me up, and forced me to go on. Japs and trucks, passing in the opposite direction, stuck out their rifle butts, clipping all the boys they could reach in the face. Then along came a Jap tank. I saw it deliberately swerve out of its course, run down an American soldier who had fallen behind a little, and crush his body into the gravel as flat as a pancake. He couldn't get out of its pathway in time. The Japs screamed and hollered with glee and spit at everyone they could in passing. It was deliberate murder, but we hadn't seen anything yet. The dysentery, diarrhea, malaria, and tropical ulcers became prevalent by the third night when we got to a place called Hermosa. That's the place where a Jap superior private, that's roughly equivalent to a corporal in our army, clubbed me across the face for no reason at all with a bamboo stick, which broke two of my teeth and split my mouth open. If they'd shot me, it would have been a blessing. We were starved, exhausted, dirty, crazy for a mouthful of even the filthiest water. Here is a figure to help compute the price we've paid. Of the 22,300 Americans captured on Bataan and Corregidor, 7,700 died in the first year of their imprisonment. Said Saul Bloom of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, We hold the rats responsible from the emperor down to the lowest ditch digger for a million years. The march of death was a blow the fighting men in the Pacific arena were most anxious to return. In the air, U.S. aviators attacked Rabaul again and again. Mutual listeners heard a recording, the first of its type ever made, from inside a bombing plane over Jap territory. The next voice you hear will be that of Lieutenant Joseph E. Butler in his plane about to drop bombs on a Jap hill bridge. His flaps down, going 300 knots, the lieutenant describes the action as he goes into a dive. And as he speaks... Listen for Jap anti-aircraft opening up. Having dropped his bombs, Lieutenant Butler pulls away from his target, then reports once again. He sees Japs and opens fire with his machine guns. Lieutenant Butler returned safely to his base, his mission part of the prologue to the crushing blow at the Marshall Islands that was on its way. Admiral Raymond Spruance was coming in for a payoff on a battleship near Kwajalein in the Marshalls. We're pretty close to those little. Condition one? Condition one, sir. We're ready, sir. Turn on the loudspeaker. Loudspeaker, sir. Men, in a few seconds, Mr. Sukiyaki will be directly in front of your gun. So let's play what they call Tokyo Poker. To open, you have to have two dead Japs or better. Admiral Spruance and his men moved into the marshals and knocked the Japs galley west. A sample of what it was like on those islands was heard by mutual listeners in a broadcast entitled A Night in a Foxhole, a recording that illustrated the effect of 24 hours of battle on a man. This record was made the night after the Marines came ashore, by Tech Sergeants Keen Hepburn and Fred Welkin. Notice the carefree, innocent quality of this young Marine's voice when he first landed. Listen. Just landed here about 15 minutes ago, and I don't know whether I sound scared or not, but I am. Rifles popping a lot, but there's rifles and uh, just everything in the book is going off around this joint. The Moor Islands. Uh, down in the Kwajalein, and boy, this is really a hot place. 
Twenty-four hours later, the same man speaks, or what you might grimly call the same man. From the same foxhole, this is after 24 hours in the rain without sleep, after the agonizing crisis of ducking Jap bullets for hours without end. My teeth are chattering so bad I can hardly talk. It's awfully cold. That is, it's cold because we've been... It rained all night. We've been sitting in it. We've got very little, if any, sleep. The uh, orders were given that we all dig in foxholes close together. Well, there goes tracer fire right over us now. Uh, so uh, the boys are all pretty, pretty cold and damp through. Oh, this is this has really been something. These Japs have been in hide themselves to what's left of these trees. They're only a few trees, but well, I think they've shot a Jap out of every one of them. Then the concrete toolboxes that they had around here were really something. And uh, the thickness. These things were built for eternity by the looks of things. But they weren't built with the idea of taking 14, 16 inch shells and 2,000 pound bombs. And that's what they got. Thanks to the durability of such men, Admiral Nimitz was soon able to take over officially the first originally held Jap territory to yield to American attack. But there was no opportunity to celebrate the victory, for word came that Mutual's 51 year old Raymond Clapper had paid the cost of victory too. The 16th American reporter to die while on duty, Mr. Clapper lost his life in a crash of a naval airplane while covering the Marshall story. Mr. Clapper was one of many great Americans we lost in 1944. There was also Frank Knox, Al Smith, Wendell Wilkie, and Manuel Quezon, president of the Philippines, who in a sense was an American too. <laughs> Psychologists might have said the home front American last spring was having too hard a time facing the brutal facts of World War II. So he went on a forgetful spree. Americans jammed nightclubs, drank very rare wine, and sang one of the wackiest jingles ever to sweep the country. From coast to coast, it was Mersey Dotes and Dozy Dotes and Little Lamsey Divey. In their search for laughter, Americans formed a touching friendship, too, with a non-existent but lovable Italian named Umbriago, invented by comedian Jimmy Durante. We were short on butter, bacon and sugar, and cigarettes. On Chicago's North Michigan Avenue, two men were strolling and... Boy, I wish the football game. What a fight. It was a riot. They were knocking each other's heads off. Must have been some game, huh? Game nothing. A guy in the grandstand dropped a cigarette. We were long on parties, dates, and vacation trips. It became almost impossible to get a hotel room. A man named Roger Ferguson walked into the lobby of a hotel in Indianapolis. Hey, are you the room clerk? Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Are you kidding? I want a room. <laughs> Wipe that smile off your face. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I can't help it. The way you people get so burnt up. Oh, I don't get a room, eh? <laughs> Not unless you want to sleep in the phone booth. Why, you, you... Oh, What's wrong? What's happened? Stop that man. Stop him. Why, what did he do? What did he do? I wouldn't give him a room, so... So he bit off the end of my nose. <laughs> On our 1944 time schedule, the next step was to capture Rome. To do this, Allied forces landed on the Italian coast at Anzio. Meanwhile, below Anzio, the 5th was fighting to capture that city and make a junction with the men at Anzio. Major Frank Pellegrin gave mutual listeners an on-the-scene account of the fighting as he spoke from a point just 2,000 yards from Casino. U.S. dive bombers were just coming in over their targets. Dropping high explosive 
and incendiary shells, and they obviously hit a German ammunition or petrol dump because there is a great sheet of flame rising and black clouds billowing up against the Africa. That is really a bullseye. The last of the two, the last two of the dive bombers that just finished their run. I can see the bombs falling. Now a hit, a flash is a big hit. You can hear the roar of the plane, I believe, as it pulls out of the dive. And as the other one, the other final bomb goes in and it explodes. Along the highway. It was the same story at Casino as it was in a dozen other places. Hard fighting, foot by foot and yard by yard. We were coming slowly closer to the next stop on the timetable. Invasion of Europe from the West. The first all-American radio station in Europe threw the switch on its 12 medium-wave transmitters to bring the truth to the oppressed people of the European continent. On a memorable day, the Voice of America returned to warm the hearts of Europeans and to report to them on the forthcoming invasion. This is the Voice of America, one of the United Nations. The Germans heard the roll of the Yankee Doodle drums and peered nervously across the 21 miles of water between Dover and Calais. The waters of the Channel stirred violently. The ring of rosy around Hitler's festung Europa was tightening. We were on time. The Anzio beachhead and the casino front were joined. An account of the event was broadcast from Naples by Seymour Corman. Early this morning at 7.31... There was an historic meeting on the Strada Latoriana, which cuts through the Pontine Marshes near the sea. There, two American Army officers, Captain Ben Souza of Honolulu, Hawaii, and First Lieutenant Francis Buckley of Philadelphia met. They shook hands. They pounded each other on the back. Their men came up, and there were similar gestures of joy and thanksgiving. For at last... After four months and three days, Anzio was no longer isolated. Its gallant troops had effected a junction with our main forces driving up from the south. The joining of the beachhead was followed inevitably by the capture of Rome itself. The bells in Rome were calling worshippers to Mother Church as U.S. jeeps tore up the road to the Eternal City, the backfiring of their exhaust pipes making a staccato accompaniment to the sweet music of U.S. grenades. As Allied troops entered the city, William Strand brought mutual listeners this report of the spectacle. This is William Strand, speaking from Rome. Yes, this lovely ancient city is really ours now. At the moment, there are throngs of American newboys walking through the streets and up and down the hills where Roman warriors have crossed so proudly and gone by. But these boys are bearded and looking. Some of them have come a long way, across Africa, through Sicily. Up from the landing to Salerno and across the weary, bloody miles from the Anzio beachhead. Today, such long scenes have taken them to its heart. There are grinning, shouting, clapping civilians everywhere. There are bright summer clothing, a riot of color in the afternoon sunshine. And vast crowds were climbing along the road leading to the city proper. Sometimes our trucks and jeeps took the road. They seem enthusiastic and friendly, tossing flowers and raising a flag on their American flag. The capture of Rome was eclipsed immediately by other news. On the morning of June 6th at 12.45 a.m., mutual listeners, at least the night owls who catch the dance music on the early morning schedules, heard this. London. The German news agency, Transocean, said today in a broadcast that a lied invasion had begun. This is an unsubstantiated enemy claim. The unsubstantiated claim was backed up at 3.32 a.m., from Supreme Allied Headquarters, Colonel R. Ernest Dupuy, General Eisenhower's press aide, said, Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This was it. This was the moment the entire world had awaited for so many heartbreaking years. In a suburban home, almost anywhere in the United States... Sorry I woke you up, darling. No, of course not. You know, 
I always thought when the flash about the second front came through, I'd, well, I'd stand up and cheer. It's funny. I don't want to cheer at all. Neither do I. I feel so helpless just sitting here. When you think of all those kids going across the channel, I want to, I want to do something for them. I know what I'm going to do. What? It'll help too, dear. I'm sure it will. I'm going to pray to God, darling. I'm going to pray to Almighty God. Going across the channel were 4,000 ships, 12 battleships, 8,000 planes, four airborne divisions, two parachute divisions, and thousands of plane GIs in landing craft. Going across the channel was the American dream, for on a front from Cherbourg to La Havre, America was, as President Roosevelt said so many years ago, heading for a rendezvous with destiny. Destiny, indeed, was waiting in the morning mist on the beaches of Normandy. Many a G.I. must have recalled the order of the day from General Eisenhower. The tide has turned. The full men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck. And let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Shortly after 4 a.m., American listeners heard radio reporter Richard Hodelet broadcasting an eyewitness account of how the Allies hit those beaches. I watched the first landing barges hit the beach exactly on the minute of each hour. I was in a 9th Air Force marauder flying at 4,500 feet along 20 miles of the invasion coast. From what I could see during those first few minutes, there was nothing stopping the assault parties from getting ashore. We spent about half an hour over enemy territory. We flew over and bombed some of the coastal fortifications, but except for some light flats and inland positions and from some tanks firing at us, we saw no enemy gunfire. We had cast our lot on D-Day along with our fellows in arms, our British comrades ready to die shoulder to shoulder with the kids from the drugstores in Pittsburgh and the ball fields on the south side. In this hour of crisis... His Majesty, King George of England, spoke too. But please God, both now and in the future, not to remote, the predictions of an ancient psalm may be fulfilled. The Lord will give strength unto his people. And the Lord will give his people of the blessing of peace. The French coast and colored parachutes, tough, gum-chewing yanks bailed out. The same fishing trawlers that had evacuated Dunkirk claimed their measure of glory as they proudly cut the waves. The same battleships that had gone down at Pearl Harbor, like forgotten ghosts, reared suddenly up to fire one barrage after the other. In an astonishing broadcast, on a ship in the channel, George Hicks, spoke from amidst the hell of invasion itself as a Nazi plane swooped overhead. Here we go again. Another plane's come over. Right over on our port side. plane was hit and down it came burning. George Hicks continued over the noise of battle and the shouts of the triumphant crew. They got one. They got one. We got that one. We got it right here. Did we? Yeah. Put this one. 
great blotch of fire came down in the small ring now, just off our port side in the sea. Smoke and flame there. You said it. I get the pain to smack. I'll make it look like it. We've had a few minutes far. The lights of that burning Nazi plane are just twinkling now in the sea and going out. Still another breathtaking account of that first day came from Mutual's Larry Meyer, who from a vantage point overhead saw wave after wave of men wading through the restless waters to the sands of France. The run-in by the great mass of Lilliputian craft was made through heavy seas, with the English Channel kicking up in traditional fashion. Big waves broke over the sides of the landing barges, drenching all the troops, which merely was good preparation for the ducking they took when they had to plow waist-deep through the surf onto the beaches. Each had his rifle wrapped in oil skin to keep out the salt water. The boys grew grim as the beach drew nearer. In fact, some grew seasick, and it was pretty tough when one is seasick to have to face gunfire. German shells were bursting all around us. One came within 200 feet of the barge I was in, but it burst harmlessly in the water. Other shells sank two tank landing craft. On the beach, the waves who had gone in before were lying prone on the sand, sometimes edging slowly forward towards the bluff and machine gun nests before them. At the little village just northwest of Cannes, high on the cliff, one could see a vicious German 88-millimeter cannon causing all kinds of havoc among our troops. Many casualties resulted from her fire before she was silenced. Mortar shells burst among our forces. Machine guns raked the beaches. The last wave had not landed before barges started taking off casualties. After the first beachhead had been established, Charles Collingwood described how our glider forces hurtled down from the skies. Remarkable sights of this invasion so far. Two great fleets of over a hundred gliders have gone overhead, towed by C-47 transports, who are certainly proving the workhorses of this invasion. They've hauled them right over the beaches, and it seems as though the German gunners, amazed at this incredible sight, have. Uh, stopped firing on the beach now because it's quiet here, and the second batch are droning over now. I can see them. They're casting off the gliders as they circle around over the beach, and the transports are circling around and uh, uh, beginning to, to, to make off home. Where they're landing, we don't know because we're down here on the beach, and there's a seawall in front of us, and we can't see the land behind. This is the way the beach looks, which was hit by our troops about uh, 12 hours ago, early this morning. It's a flat, sandy beach, like almost any beach that you're likely to see. And it uh, slopes gently away from the shore, uh, from the seashore, up to the dunes, and then to the sea wall which uh, was the first objective of our troops and which they took early on in the game. D-Day had come, the number one item on our time chart. That night, as exhausted American boys in olive drab opened their K-rations in the shadow of French peasant huts and listened to the nervous alien jabber of Normandy farmers, our commander-in-chief led the people of these United States in prayer. nation joined in. The bearded ship carpenters in New England, the lumberjacks of the Northwest, the husky truck driver waiting for a cup of black coffee in the diner on US-1, and the tight-lipped young mother in a Colorado flat, staring first at the baby, then at the lieutenant's picture on the dresser. All the nation prayed with the president, as he said, With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed 
and racial arrogances lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. One of the first glider pilots to land in France also was the first casualty to be brought back to the United States by air evacuation from Normandy. He was Colonel Mike Murphy. Interviewed when he arrived at Mitchell Field, New York, Colonel Murphy described his landing in a glider at 3.53 a.m. on D-Day. Well, there was um, about five gliders coasted into the uh, same end of the field as I did. And uh, when my glider came to rest, I was within 15 feet of a enemy reconnaissance tank column. What a spot to be in. What would you think of a time like that? Well, I was pinned in and I couldn't move. I talked to the passengers in a low tone of voice and told them what was in front of us and uh, told them to hit the ditch if they could because I couldn't move. In about 15 seconds, they started the motors up on the tanks and moved off. Uh, they moved past the uh, other park gliders, and the boys were out around them, didn't fire a shot. Uh, and then you were in the clear. We were in the clear for the time being, but... Uh, there were snipers and machine gun nests all around the field, and uh, they had been shooting at us on the way in. Uh, we had, uh, uh, most of the fields in France have uh, ditches around them that make a good trench, so we crawled around in those uh, trenches, set up guns to ward off any attack. After telling of his D-Day experience, Colonel Murphy spoke of what it was like to be one of the wounded, evacuated by air from the scene of battle. We had a very nice trip back. ATC took good care of us. The air evacuation nurses were very courteous and helpful. And uh, we had, uh, had wonderful pilots all the way in. Hitler was very far from being finished. He let loose with a secret weapon, robot bombs. Soon they were falling on British factories, homes, hospitals. Winston Churchill added another number for the final reckoning of what the war costs. In the first four weeks alone, robot bombs killed almost 3,000 Englishmen. From a point in southern England, immediately after this menace developed, mutual listeners heard the actual sound of a robot bomb in flight. Listen. Notice how the engine cuts off just before it explodes. Robot bombs, later buzz bombs, fired indiscriminately, set off violent discussion among the United Nations. On a lecture platform in the Middle West... I say again, what are we going to do with Germany? This is a question every one of us must answer. What are we going to do with a nation that makes bestiality its guiding principle? Kill them all! Kill every rotten one of them! Is that what you want? Do you want to stoop to the level of their barbarism? What's making you so soft on it? You gotta just kiss and make up with the Germans? Did you see the newsreel pictures of those English mothers digging their children's bodies out of the ruins? Yeah, how about that? Yes, how about that? 
Raising post-war problems was like smacking a hornet's nest with a tennis racket. At Dumbarton Oaks, at Bretton Woods, at the Citadel in Quebec, the same question came up over and over again. How shall we handle a defeated Germany? It was soon given a melodramatic touch. A cloud of mystery gathered around the leader of the Germans. Where was Hitler? Was he alive or dead? What had become of him? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Driscoll. I can tell you all about Hitler. You see, I've been reading every one of the newspapers in the magazine. Hitler has... Uh, yes? Hitler has... Uh, Apoplexy, globus, hystericus, dementia, precox, cerebral embolism, also a member of stomatitis, paroxysmal tachycardia, tabistor, salicylic, paralytic, myosinia, neurosinia, psychothenia, and a terrible headache. I see. And do you know where he is? Why, of course I do. You see, he decided to plan a fourth submarine to Tokyo and grab the Argentina port of San Hideaway with a fringe airplane made of gold and money hidden in a bank vault in Stockholm because the glamour birth has gotten mountain fortress was a crowded place to be, don't you think? Thank you very much. Well, that's all right, Mr. Driscoll. Just ask me anything. Always glad to help. Only today, Americans heard from Allied Supreme Headquarters it was Hitler himself who planned the present great German offensive, proving he was not really listening to the goony goony birds and going completely pineapple. The last time America heard the voice of Adolf Hitler was immediately following an attempt on his life in late July. Listen now to this historic recording from this network's files. Hitler's last words in public. On July 21st, as he attacks what he calls the arch-criminals who schemed to kill him. I am looking for Hitler's tomb. I was at Lublin in Poland as a Soviet investigator. The Germans had a death camp where they used a new type of gas to slaughter helpless civilians. In one day, they annihilated 18,000 villagers. Then they cremated their bodies. They first stripped the bodies of their clothing and sent the suits and dresses back to Germany for the citizens of the Reich to wear. Those citizens who could stomach the idea. Almost a million pairs of shoes were sent back to Germany from the crematories, including many pairs of baby shoes. Last July, America selected its presidential candidates. In a feverish Chicago stadium, the Republicans held their 23rd convention and nominated Thomas E. Dewey and John Bricker. The clamor of U.S. politics moved into high gear. The tired old men of Roosevelt's administration are on the way out. Bureaucracy and bungling will get their walking papers on election day. In Chicago, the Democratic Party nominated Roosevelt for a fourth term. In his acceptance speech, the president quoted another wartime leader, Abraham Lincoln, as he said, With us in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on. To finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who have borne the battle, and for all, and to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Two aspects of the election were most important. One was the inspiring truth that we were probably the only country on earth that dared to hold an election at this time. The other was the unquestionable fact that labor, more specifically the CIO's political action committee, was in politics to stay. One of the most prominent passengers riding on FDR's wagon was the CIO's Sidney Hillman. Yeah, clear it with Sidney. What do you mean? What's wrong with Hillman? Now, he don't do anything. Yeah, well, take a minute, but you trouble, you guys, you really While Americans developed election hysteria, 
General Eisenhower and his men were executing the 1944 plot for victory. It took three weeks of back-breaking effort to capture Sherburg. BBC reporter Robert Dunnett on the outskirts of Sherburg broadcast a description of a youth to smash a nest of German snipers. I'm, I'm sitting with an American infantry unit here, and guns have opened up on us, or fire has opened up on us, from the Fort de Rule, or at least from the edge of the Fort de Rule, on my right. The hill that's towering above us, the rocky hill on the right, and the American troops on the road here are coming under fire and shooting the head at uh, snipers who are still up there. And then just ahead of us on the crossroads, I can see the smoke clearing away where American mortars have been firing at Germans in the houses just beyond us. Now there's rifle fire, mortar fire, and the Americans are bringing up machine guns running along the side of the road here in the shelter of the wall, crouching down and preparing to let off with this machine gun. Dogged scrapping characterized our advances everywhere. Sherberg's fall was a cue to General Montgomery to seize Kong. BBC's Stuart McPherson spoke from the roof of a farmhouse in Kong, in dead center of the furious battle. This attack started roughly eight, eight minutes to go. And now the tail end of the first wave of 300 heavy bombers is coming in. And now there is definitely hardly any flak at all and little wonder. When one considers the load that these four engine bombers are carrying, plus the shelling that's going on, well, there's your answer. You just can't do it. You can't face up to a superiority in numbers, both in men and in tonnage of bombs. And there's a blinding flag. The way over to the left and the pit of smoke. No, they're not. They're going right in steady as ever again. Bombers, varying height, going right, <coughs> right in over that target. And it's the same old story as it was eight minutes ago. An unbroken line of bombers swinging in and turning as they come out over the target. It's an absolute black curtain over where I'm looking now, over Kaw and Garcia. After three days of fighting, Ka fell. The news was good. We were on time on both sides of the globe. Saipan and the Marianas with an airfield just 1,500 miles from Tokyo was taken by the Marines. Yes, the news was good. Too good. My husband just came back from Washington, and he says the war can't last longer than September 15th. I'll take the victory up, sweet Raymond, and pack the curls tightly on top of my head. On the Riviera, where decadent generations of the past had sunned themselves and spun roulette wheels, the 7th Army struck on August 15th at 5 a.m. with an armada of a thousand ships. The news was excellent. It was almost unbelievable. On Friday, August 25th, the Allies, in company with three French forces of the interior, raised the Nazi yoke from the bruised shoulders of Paris. Listen now as the Paris radio itself shouts with triumph. This is the French National Radio. This morning at 7.15 a.m., tanks and service vehicles of Leclerc's divisions entered by the Fort de Châtillon and went by the Boulevard Brune towards the Port d'Orléans. The crowd was able to read on every tank names dear to us. Franche Comté, Champagne, Alsace, and so on. No description could capture the joy of Frenchmen. Only the voices of the French themselves could tell that. The voices of the French singing their national anthem for the very first time in four years. On the bridge of Avignon, the French sang La Marseillaise, and men of goodwill everywhere sang it with them. Paris had one ominous note. On the afternoon of August 26th, 
General de Gaulle was leading a victory procession to the Notre Dame Cathedral when an attempt was made on his life. BBC's Robert Reed was within a few feet of the general. Listen to Reed's commentary, punctuated by the actual shots of the would-be assassins. The general is now turned to face the square in this huge crowd of Parisians, who is being presented to people... He's being received. He's being received. Even while the general is marching. Even while the general is marching into the cathedral. A rioting mob that broke loose when the shots were fired engulfed Robert Reed. For a moment he could not speak. But then. Well, that was one of the most dramatic scenes I've ever seen. Just as General de Gaulle was about to enter the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Firing started all over the place. I'm afraid we couldn't get you the noise of that firing because I was overwhelmed by a rush of people who were trying to seek shelter and my cable passed it from my microphone. But I fell just near General de Gaulle and I managed to pick myself up. General de Gaulle was trying to control the crowds rushing into the cathedral. He walked straight ahead into what appeared to me to be a hail of fire from somewhere inside the cathedral, somewhere from the galleries up near the vaulted roof, but he went straight ahead without hesitation, his shoulders flung back, and walked right down the central aisle, even while the bullets were pouring around him. It was the most extraordinary example of courage that I've ever seen. General de Gaulle's courage was indeed a model for Frenchmen everywhere. So, too, was a message to the people of France from General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Said General Eisenhower, Liberty had returned to one of his traditional homes. And the glory of having freed the capital belonged to Frenchmen. All members of the Allied force would like to pay their paternal admiration to the people of Paris. On their behalf, I present to the city a shield. It is the shield of the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force. It symbolizes... The sword of liberty, cutting aside the blackness of German tyranny and rising under the colors of the United Nations to the blue sky of freedom and of peace. The Allied Express train was on time everywhere and moving at top speed. We, we smashed into Holland. Under Lieutenant General Braden, 1,000 C-47s, sky trains carrying determined paratroopers, poured men onto Dutch soil. Ed Murrow, from inside a plane, described how the paratroopers jumped. You can probably hear the snap as they check the lashing on the static line. They travel back now. There it goes. You hear them shout? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Every man out, I can see their shoots going down now. Every man clear. They're dropping just beside a little windmill near a church. Hanging there very gracefully. Seems to be completely relaxed, as I said a moment ago, like nothing so much as khaki dolls hanging beneath a green lampshade. You see one man go down just north of the little road. The whole sky is filled with parachutes. As we came into Holland, victory became like that prosperity of the last decade, a hallelujah day that was just around the corner. The Balkans were cracking at the seams. Admiral Nimitz took the Palaio Archipelago. Civilians had many a good reason to believe Germany was about to be bowled over with a ten strike. In Manhattan, plans were made for an all-star, all-night celebration in Carnegie Hall. Romania dropped out of the war. So did Finland. Then, the Allies caught it. We got a taste of what it would like be like to take Germany. For the Germans had monkey-wrenched our master time chart. They clung for all they were worth to valuable channel ports, forcing us to ship supplies halfway across France to reach our men in action. The Germans knew the value of time, and they played for it. They stalled us at the channel ports. Then, like a hunted fox, they fled, but systematically across France, just out of our reach. We lost more time. Finally, in a daring attempt to get back to our 1944 time schedule, a British airborne division hit Arnhem. 
But by now, the Germans had time to organize, to make a stand. The British were soon close to tragedy. They needed help and reinforcements. But for a full week, we couldn't get through to them. ABC reporter Stanley Maxted landed with the British at Arnhem. And here is his account of how we dropped supplies by air to our lives. Supplies that got past Nazi anti-aircraft to the stranded British at Arnhem. Just a few minutes ago, the fighter cover showed up. And right behind them came those lovely supply planes that you can hear up above us now. And this morning, our supplies came, and they were dropped in the wrong place. The enemy got them. But now, the planes have come over, and they've dropped them right dead over. Everybody is, is cheering and uh, clapping, and they, they, they just can't uh, give them to their feelings about what a wonderful sight this is. All these bundles of parachuted packages and ammunition is, uh, are coming down here all around us, through the trees, bouncing on the ground, the men are running out to get them, and you have no idea what this means to us to see this ammunition and this food coming down here where the men can get it. Yes, after Arnhem, the honeymoon was over. No one dared guess now how long it would take to lick the Germans. The great blueprint we'd drawn up at the beginning of the year would have to be revised. We'd lost too much time. Strangely enough, where we had been pessimistic regarding Japan, the picture in the Pacific changed suddenly. General Douglas MacArthur crossed Leyte Gulf and led his men ashore on the Philippines. The man who had slipped away under a merciful night sky years ago returned to fulfill his sacred vow. To the Filipinos, General MacArthur said... People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, our forces stand again on Philippine soil, soil consecrated in the blood of our two peoples. The general went on recalling Corregidor, holding it up as a challenge to oust the Jap. Let the indomitable spirit of Bataan and Corregidor lead on. As the lines of battle roll forward to bring you within the zone of operations, rise and strike. Strike at every favorable opportunity. For your homes and hearts, strike. For future generations of your sons and daughters, strike. In the name of your sacred dead, strike. Let no heart be faint. Let everyone be steeled. The guidance of divine God points the way. Follow with his name to the holy grail of righteous victory. Immediately after MacArthur's landing on Leyte, the cornered Jap, like a lion, struck wildly out with one paw. It was U.S. Navy Day, too and it was Admiral Halsey's chance to deliver a blow to the Jap Navy from which it would never recover. Twenty-four Jap warships hit the bottom of the Sulu Sea, and of 60 Jap warships that went into action, only two escaped without damage. Douglas MacArthur had a green light. On November 7th, the American people returned Franklin D. Roosevelt to the White House in Washington for the fourth consecutive time. The violent presidential campaign ended in the early morning hours of November 8th, when Thomas E. Dewey, who had polled one of the greatest minority votes of the past decades, speaking from New York, said, I extend to President Roosevelt my hearty congratulations and my earnest hope that his next term will see speedy victory in the war the establishment of lasting peace, and the restoration of tranquility among our people. I am deeply grateful for the confidence expressed by so many million Americans for their labors in, and for their labors in the campaign. The Republican Party emerges from the election, revitalized, and a great force for the good of the country and for the preservation of free government in America. I am confident that all Americans will join me in a devout hope 
that in the years ahead, divine providence will guide and protect the President of the United States. A few days later, FDR returned to Washington in high spirits. He was to be temporarily cheered by word that B-29s reached Tokyo and other vital objectives on Nippon's mainland. But as the year drew to a close, issues of enormous gravity turned up. Ailing Cordell Hull had to resign, and the State Department had to be reconstructed. Greece was torn by civil war, a civil war so violent that only today there was word of a plot to assassinate Winston Churchill, now in Greece, to settle the dispute. So in the very last weeks of the year, our 1944 timetable for victory had to be tossed into the scrap heap. Not only had the German army escaped us in France and stalled our plans, but it had managed, in defense of its homeland, to mount a new gigantic counteroffensive. At a German staff meeting on the Western Front. Well, gentlemen, it's like old times, eh? Yeah. Who would have thought the day would come when we would again see the Allies retreating? Going back, mile after mile. We push them back. <laughs> yeah, a counteroffensive will cost them months and months. It's very helpful. <laughs> so helpful. You see, we waste so much more time, so much more their time. That is the key to their pure strategy, gentlemen. The Allies suffer a wonderful drop in morale as the war drags on, drags on. They become tired, dissatisfied. Finally, disunited. You see the signs for breakup now between the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. Oh, I have high hopes for 1945, gentlemen. So has Berlin. So has Berlin. As we attempted to check the German counteroffensive and fought the bloodiest battles of the war to do it, the president addressed the nation on Christmas Eve. The tide of battle has turned. Slowly but inexorably, against those who sought to destroy civilization. And so on this Christmas Day, we cannot yet say when our victory will come. Our enemies still fight fanatically, they still have reserves of men and military power. But they themselves know that they and their evil works are doomed. We may hasten the day of that doom if we here at home continue to do our full share. And we pray that that day may come soon. We pray that until then, God will protect our gallant men and women in the uniforms of the United Nations, that he will receive into his infinite grace those who make their supreme sacrifice in the cause of righteousness, in the cause of love of him and his teaching. We pray that with victory will come a new day of peace on earth in which all the nations of the earth will join together for all time. That is the spirit of Christmas, the holy day. May that spirit live and grow throughout the world in all the years to come. If we are expecting a pleasant and safe and sunny finish to the story of 1944, we may be disappointed. The finish to the story of the year was exactly what the rest of the year had been like. Dangerous, deadly, and with a constant gnawing pain that accompanies winning a war. In a home in Middletown... I don't understand it. Honest, I don't. You read the papers every day, and the more you read, the less you know. What's it all about? Which way are we going? What's it all add up to? You know what it adds up to. You know what it means. To you, it means worrying about your boys in service and your wife at the Red Cross twice a week and bonds and the blood bank and the carpool and a thousand other very personal things. That's what it means to you. Sacrifice, that's the word. 
And it means a lot of much bigger things, too. Oh, I don't know. They talk fancy about this being a war for permanent peace and brotherhood and all that malarkey. But I don't believe it. Why, Churchill and Stalin and Roosevelt are going in three different directions already. How do you know? Because they haven't met? They will. They'll get together and put Europe in order. Oh, is that so? They have the right to fix Europe the way they want it, huh? Who said we should run all the little countries? We're not running them. We're just trying to make them behave till we win the war. You can't win a war with revolutions and riots going on. Well, I think we ought to leave Europe alone. Let it go to pot if it wants to. That's the attitude that's caused two world wars already. Now, listen, suppose we do win the war in 45. Won't we have enough to worry about here at home without going to Europe to look for trouble? We'll have millions of boys coming back looking for jobs. You going to just forget about them? And we'll have thousands of boys who'll never come back. Who died for world democracy. Are you going to forget about them? No. No, I... I guess we can. Huh. <sighs> 